David Booth, welcome back to the deep end. It feels good to be back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and we're recording this with Studio Box, so it feels like we're actually looking at each other, not doing that awkward Zoom angle, uh, Logitech, uh, you got it at Best Buy at a weekend thing going on. I kind of want to start here because this is always why it's fun to check in with you. The broad narrative in the space right now. I think when we chatted last, everyone's moving to New York City. You're thinking about how long you're gonna be spending in Miami. SF is not the conversation. I think you you barely have to peruse Twitter to know, but there's deep interest in coming back to San Francisco. There's a lot of like tweets about San Francisco. Where do you think the discourse is around where the best place to start a company is? You're right to say it's a, a hot topic. Um, everybody was out there, you know, somewhat celebrating, not you know, or, or, or certainly discussing the downfall of San Francisco through the COVID era. You know, the world has changed for good. Companies can be built everywhere, talent is everywhere. You know, there's some some pieces of that that I, I do genuinely believe, and and one of those is, like, I think through the COVID era, uh, we learned that companies can be built anywhere. You can start a company anywhere around. Um, but also coming out of that, we learned that people are deeply hungry for personal connection and they want to come together places. They want to build relationships in person. And when you look around and say, well, where are we going to come together? There is this powerful network effect of, you know, just the history of this, this area, the, the, the raw uh, talent that you know, still exists here, the, the company building, starting, scaling, funding experience that still persists here. Um, and it's you know, when you look at it through that lens, it feels natural that a lot of the energy is gravitating back here. Uh, in, in fact, you know, one hot take could be that it was part of COVID that created some of the vacancy, it, it, you know, pushed some of the people out who had maybe made their money, you know, built their families, were ready to move back to the Midwest or move back to, you know, to, to raise their families. And in doing so, they um, create a little bit of space, whether it's the the commercial vacancy rates or the or the or the rents that certainly took a dip uh, and allowed a new generation of builders to come through. So, um, I mean, man, I've been I've been coming here uh, probably one or two months a year for the last ten years, living in different parts of town, uh, and ever since I remember that first trip. 2013 sort of got off and felt like the sense of amb ambition set in the sense of like the weight of back home and, and all of the, the the expected behavior all of the conventional wisdom that i was raised with lifting off my shoulders and and the, the idea that i can build anything set in and today i i believe that there's something about that energy that still exists and, and on this last trip to, you know i'm in the process of you know, certainly spending a lot more time a uh, large part of this and, and next year in the area um and the energy is just, it's in the air. It's almost, you can almost taste it. Um, just a lot of people, uh, a lot of excitement, uh, you know, a lot of enthusiasm, which is sort of that cautious optimism hedged within the, the, the greater narrative of, of everything bad out, you know, that's going on as, as well. So really excited to explore some of those threads with you. Hearing you articulate that, David, I wanna make this really useful for builders, on deck community members, people who are thinking about joining an on deck program everything you just said, especially the energy being in the air. I know if we went back to, let's say, July 2021, we could say the same thing about going to Miami or showing up somewhere in Brooklyn. As a founder, like as a, as a, as a leader of, of, of an actual company, how do you think folks should sort through the big narrative claims versus like, okay, at a core level, you need to build a company and you can't just be thinking, this is the vibe now and that's the vibe now. How do you think through that? Yeah, there's a, a, a quote I, I attribute it to Andreas Klinger, one of our friends, early investors, former CTO, once told me that um, it, in person is for in innovation, uh, IRL, yeah, IRL for innovation, URL for iteration. Um, I think that what companies need to balance is to, and you know, people as, as well as to understand when you are, you know, what, are you, what stage are you at? Are, are you trying to figure it out? You need to optimize for time in a room with a whiteboard with the people and to, to innovate, to, to figure out how to go from zero to one or, or what one even might be in the first place versus you know where you're going and you need to execute and iterate and you're going to have some sort of you know, fluctuations along the way. Now, the, the balance between those means if you have, um, 
if, if you know what you're building, if you're on the path from, you know, from one to X and, and you're in the iteration part of that stage, I genuinely believe you can be anywhere. There are opportunities to bring your teams together for offsites, for retreats. Uh, I've seen some phenomenal examples recently of companies that are entirely distributed that'll plan a you know, one week leadership team retreat into every month or every, you know, every quarter. Um, there are some you know, companies popping up to facilitate that. Uh, folks like Wanda that are making the experience of finding a you know, work-friendly vacation rental, um, seamless and easy, uh, you know, many other examples. For the former example though, innovation, it's really about getting in the room with the right people. And you have to think about, well, who are the right people? Maybe in your team, you've got a critical mass on the East Coast, so you take them East. Maybe if you don't have a team, you wanna figure out who the right people are that you even wanna put in that room. And just the, you know, the, the gravitational effect of, of the Bay Area again comes back to well, where is the technical talent? Where is the experience, you know, company building, scaling talent? Where is the, you know, the capital, the people who've done this before, seen this before, can give you the right advice over a cup of coffee that they probably wouldn't give you over a Zoom call. And there's this, well, um, t tie that to the, the ambition. Now, if p p everybody is wired differently, and, 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 and I don't want to make any claim here that applies to everybody, because that is impossible. Yeah. Uh, what you do want to say is, well, some people are wired for like, I need to build something big in the world. I need to make an impact. I need to be the best. And in an incredibly competitive environment, you know, we can talk about some more, but there, there is more noise out, out, out there in terms of different competitors that can move quickly and, 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 and lap you if you give them the chance. You need to take every advantage you've got. So if you aren't the one moving to the Bay Area with the chance of getting backed by the right angel or hiring the right VP that's done it before or you know, finding the right co-founder, maybe someone else is. And maybe the company they build is gonna, you know, gonna be faster to the prize, you know, faster to the Series A, and in a, you know, a, a binary game of, of, of asymmetric returns, uh, the power law of return of, of, of the startup industry, you know, if you're not winning, <laughs> what are you? Again, with the disclaimer that that mentality doesn't apply to everyone. And if, and if, you, if you aspire to build um, you know, a, a, a valuable uh, revenue stream, if you, if you aspire to build sort of a, a solid comp, there, there's a many reasons you don't need to move today not saying everyone should, but I think there's something really powerful there that speaks to that strain of, of ambition to change the world that really makes it necessary. You know, I'm just curious before we get into the kind of some of the program changes I want to discuss, how have you seen the Bay Area change over the past three years? So for example, I first came to San Francisco in the startup tech context in 2019. So right before COVID, and it was incredible, like we said, the energy, it's amazing to get off of the Uber from SFO, and then all of a sudden there's all these people in coffee shops and you're in the middle of all of that. Obviously, for a couple of different reasons, that really went away during 2020, 2021. So like, what was your experience just going through SF during this period? I think, I mean, my experience really closely tracks the, the evolution of what we've been doing as, as on deck. Uh, if, I, if I look back to the very, very early days, you know, pre-company, pre anything at all, on deck was a community. It was a community run by volunteers like myself. Eric Torenberg founded it 2016 when he was leaving Product Hunt asking himself the question of like, what am I gonna do next? I might start a company, I might start a fund. Where, like, where do I find my people? Where do I find everybody else that's thinking like this? So he you know, put the tweet out, put the Product Hunt launch out, had thousands of applications and started running these dinners for you know, maybe 15, 20, 25 people, get them in the room together, set the ground rules, you know, this is a sacred space, it's confidential, it's, you know, a place to open up and be vulnerable about leaving your job and all of the fears that you have for doing so, about the ambitions of where you want to go and is it the right, you know, do I have conviction that this is the right solution to that problem? Um, so I attended one of those dinners and I, I loved it. I, I had, you know, such good time that I, I told Eric I'd love to run these for you in London. Um, I did, you know, I did 15 or so over the course of 2016 through 19. Uh, there were people running them in New York and Tel Aviv and Austin and Boston and about 23 cities around the world, um, but purely sort of a, a community play. Now, as that momentum grew, it kind of tracked what I see as like the build up in, in energy across the tech industry from again, 2016 through 1920. Um, and if you remember around the right, you know, that time, there was this cohort of companies maturing into unicorns, decacorns, public listings. Um, there was a lot of people 
who'd ridden the you know the the, the roller coaster or the rocket ships of Airbnb and Stripe and um, of, of Open Door of, of of Flexport, um, and they'd seen how the sausage was made, you know, seen what it looks like to go from fifty to five hundred, but they hadn't done that themselves. They hadn't led that themselves. So we saw this opportunity. So the right time, right people, a lot of phenomenally talented people on the market. The accelerator market was stagnant at the time. It was hadn't seen a lot of innovation uh, in a very long time. It was, you know, YC doing 125 for 7% was about the, the basis. But there was this real hunger for community out of it. Like YC is really valuable. It's a huge amount of respect for what they've built over the years. They do something pretty valuable, but it's like, it's if, if you don't need it, if you've got the network already, if you've got angels who want to back you, if you've got people that want to support you, it's pretty tempting just to say, I'm going to go it alone. And we believe that in the, um, yeah, in those early stages of the journey, winners are made by those who can build the right product fastest, who can rally you know, a community of their own to support and give them the right feedback, ultimately to help them hire, help them sort of break through. And that's a really valuable thing that even if you've got the best network in the world, even if you've got, you know, even if you've got every VC smashing down your door to, to write you a check, getting the feedback from that early cohort of users is incredibly valuable. So, you know, we caught lightning in a bottle somewhat, ODF one and two, we're humble to, you know, there's healthy amounts of luck in every startup journey. Um, those two cohorts absolutely took off. And that's how I feel about that sort of energy you're describing now. Um, March 2020, or fit, January through March 2020, I think it's one of those moments where basically everyone can put themselves in those shoes and picture where they were in the world. Like that's probably one of the most anxious moments of my life um, because we'd built this thing, like we'd caught lightning in a bottle, but I I'd tied it or its success and continuity to um, to being in person. I was like, there's no way this is gonna work if we can't bring people together in San Francisco in a room. Um, and sh But we can't do that because there's a pandemic <laughs> yeah, rolling through. We had, I remember we had 170 people who were pre-committed to ODF3, the third cohort. Two weeks out, everyone's booked, yeah, there's about 50, 60% lived in SF, the other, you know, the balance lived around the world and they've all booked their flights. We've booked a retreat venue. We've booked like the first eight weeks of dinner venues and co-working venues. It's all ready to go. And then we're like, oh shit, <laughs> we're, we're gonna cancel this. Um, and it was actually this forcing function. Yeah, it was the it was the, the 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 desperation as a motivator that we threw everything we had into making sure that those people who were sort of recently locked down, sheltering in place around the world, some of them just down the road from each other, but like a different universe away, had the best experience you can imagine. They they were like immersed within a really supportive community, which was this professional social outlet for founders. They maybe just quit their job before the world was pulled out from under their feet. Um, and, and it was actually, I, I attribute sort of a, a couple of moments during and after the ODF3 onboarding um, extravaganza, the you know, three hour Zoom call that people used to say was the best Zoom call of their lives um, as the moment that I was like, wow, this could actually work. So you know, we, the channeling the energy and this again, roughly tracking the industry if I, if I timestamp, you know, ODF4, we announced around the same time as Mark Anderson's time to build. Yeah, it was like the world is crumbling around us. Technology is saving us because Zoom and you know, telehealth and everything had to really step into this void. Um, people were looking at the solutions they used to use and say, well, that's kind of broken. <laughs> you know, people were looking at the companies they work for and if they if they hadn't been laid off, you know, many, many had been laid off and so were forced into this situation. Others were like, I don't know if this company works anymore. You know, is this really for me? Should I should I take this opportunity to to leave and build something new? And it was um, sort of the growth of that momentum. You know, ODF four had thousands of applications to it. It was, it was a wild sort of validation moment for us. It was uh, I, someone told me you know, people are lucky to catch lightning in a bottle once. We did it twice because that, that was that that was the second moment. Um, and. The, the, the cliches from that day, everyone's saying, well, on is everywhere and people are tweeting about it. And, and the, you know, it was this moment of shared vulnerability. We're all sheltering in place. And I found an outlet. I found something that I can really resonate with. As the, as the story goes on, um, there is sort of this huge growth and momentum that came into 2021. Everything is up and to the right. And then 2022 and everything is feeling a bit rocky and 2023 feels like this phoenix rising from the ashes moment again. Um, 
and so you know we're, we're just sort of here uh i'm happy to you know talk more about any any of that but um entrenching our values and um sort of a culture of understanding what we're shooting for in the very long term understanding why you know think about my motivation our team's motivation what we want to what we want to build in the very long term and entrenching a culture of experimentation that we can always like the throwing everything out and rebuilding is is you know not the the the, the end of the world um you know we can always continue to iterate we just need to evolve and adapt and you know coupling that with the fundamental beliefs of nothing great is built alone you know you always need to surround yourself with others you know curated cohort of talent peers who are going through that journey with you no matter what the you know the economic environment no matter what the you know the the the, the um the journey you're going through there's there's value in that so so this is you know sticking to our core values no and i think uh I'm happy you gave the answer that way because I think any founder, any creator type like myself is trying to place themselves at some point in this narrative and how they've shifted, how they've thought about things in different categories. So I think this is a good time for you to talk about like the big change that OnDeck is making because we're talking about IRL, we're talking about San Francisco for a reason. We're kind of going back to, I think, a lot of where things were in 2020, at least, you know, from a values and discourse perspective. So let's uh, understand how OnDeck is changing. Yeah. Well, one one way to look at it is, you know, a lot of what we used to do, we're, we're returning to. Um, I, I think that doesn't quite do justice to the journey of the last couple of years, because we have learned so much about how people start companies, about how people meet co-founders, how you know, make their first hires, how they validate, build conviction, how they get to that first round, how they rally the support of communities, customers. Um, and it's, I, in my opinion, it's actually the forcing function of having to do all of that virtually from like d- distributed first principles um, that makes this opportunity possible. So I wouldn't say we're, we're not going you know, back to what we used to do. I say we're basically combining four years of of running ODF and eight years of, of on deck and you know the dinner series before that into what we believe is the product or it's the experience it's the it's the journey that people need in 2023. Um, it's come from this great conviction I mentioned like nothing great is built alone. What's required today more than ever to build a category de- defining startup is an early community of believers at a time when belief is at all time low. It's really easy to be a cynic. It's really easy to be like the armchair spectator, but having the, you know, the, the, the courage to get in the arena and know that there's others in there with you can make or break that journey, you know, as well as help you obviously very tactical, get to product market fit, you know, get your first hires, that kind of thing. So the world in 2023 is very different to the, the 2019 that we left, you know, before the pandemic. Um, it was still an up and to the right market at that point. You know, there is a lot of, a lot of, uh, tourists may not be the best, you know, gratifying term for it, but a lot of, a lot of people flooding into the ecosystem because startups at the time were sort of on trend. It was buzzy. It was, so, you know, it was social status to be, uh, you know, funded. Um, it, there was a lot of like, um, uh, a, a lot, a lot which has changed now and i should i'd love to speak about this more because it's something i, I really you know passionately care about but i you know the the, the the energy that we have or the energy that we we want to channel is this one of um the in it uh, the, the 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 technology opportunity available to us i mean we're we're on the edge of a revolution ai and computing and energy and material science and aerospace and you know a lot of those things require deep ex- expertise the expertise for which is often you know, in this or in the sort of the SF or New York areas, um, you could say that like the, um, the the talent density and specifically, it, it's either, there's a really good reference here. Um, so the Slow Ventures team recently put out a blog that was a really balanced approach to this. Um, the, the idea that uh, is now really the best time to start a company. Well, we'll actually, will bad times create strong founders? And you don't start a company today unless you are really dedicated, really committed to that mission. And it's those strong founders who create good times. 2019 was good times and there was a lot of people coming for the wrong reasons. Now I believe it's gonna be really hard. (laughs) Almost everybody agrees it's a perilous time to be investing and a founder is 
making a very under undiversified investment. They're like investing everything they have in this one thing. Um, but yeah, the, the risks are harder, uh, but so are the potential rewards. And if you're somebody who can you know, break the ice and prove that the thing that you're here for is worth being here for, then you will be able to attract some of the best talent available in, in a decade. You know, people who have been disillusioned with or kicked out of the big tech companies. Some of those big tech companies are like focusing on their core, frankly, boring businesses and sort of shedding a lot of the more interesting R&D opportunities. Um, I've heard of so many people that have been laid off or disillusioned with, you know, the, the, the innovative experimental projects that they were doing at the Amazons and Googles and Facebooks of, of the world. Um, and now they're, you know, re reasonably well off through a severance package or through having worked in big tech for five or 10 years and saying, well, should I rush back into the market or should I just like finally dig that old side project out, that passion, that nights and weekends, you know, experiment that I've been entertaining for a while. And if I do that, then like, what do I do next? <laughs> you know, you're talking about people who are, who, are, who are experienced, they know how to build, but they might not have ever been a founder before themselves, or maybe they have, but times have changed and they need to refresh their network, or maybe they, um, they, they've done all of those things, but the, the customer base that they need isn't sort of native to their network. So there's this like cross pollination you know, opportunity going on. Um, so the, yeah, the, 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 the punchline, I think, why now there, there, is, there is sort of a different opportunity costs today to assess the, the, if you have the grit, the resilience to try and build a company, it is the best time to build a company. If you don't, it's a really bad time to start to try and build a company. And helping people figure out which is which is one of the, you know, one of the, the, the missions that, that I'm on is, I do believe that we need more founders. I do believe that lots of people that don't currently consider themselves like, you know, founder mentality could be. Um, I do believe there's a lot of deeply talented, deeply, te deeply technical, you know, people or, you know, people with industry expertise, um, you know, spanning decades of career who possibly never even considered starting a company and they could make some of the best founders and, and the ODF experience is designed for them just to dip their toe in the water, but do so in a way that brings some accountability to themselves, brings some sort of network density, refresh their network, brings a lot of the, the, the energy and the, and the, you know, let's do this now type energy. You know, so many things I want to follow up on, <laughs> but number one, I'm really interested in your point around grit and resilience and some people have it some people don't that's one of those things you could sort through to what degree do you think a company or even a leader such as yourself can help prospective founders be more resilient because i don't want to just act as if you know we're born with it or you're not born with it and you know if you were passing the marshmallow test when you were seven you're just going to crush being a founder if not like it's too big tech yeah. for you how do you think about how onda could play a role in helping people who just have everything they need they just need that little bit of you can do this or i can do this during a period like now yeah i love the question um and particularly because I'm, I'm, I'm on this journey. Um, I've, been, I've been leading this company for four years and building, you know, founded two companies prior to that. Uh, and the last year, like 2022, I'm probably going to reflect on as one of the worst years I've ever had. <laughs> um, just from the anxiety, the stress, the existential crises we you know, went through. Um, in the last couple of months in particular, I've had a, a real turnaround, a, a, a rejuvenation, this explosion of energy. And, and it came from, you know, over the Christmas, New Year's period, like many people, I did some, you know, deep reflection. Um, and I also had the support of this group. So I'm, I'm having um, a, a little bit of taking my own medicine here. Um, I'm part of a group of uh, 12, 13 you know, CEOs of Series A and Series B companies. Um, it was, you know, opportunity to connect on a very deep level with that group and learn about the journeys they're on like whatever i'm going through some of them are worse you know i i've speaking to people who have down rounds who are having problems with their you know lead investors directors people who are going through like substantial layoffs or shit you know product 
market fits entirely evaporate or what do we do next? So part of it was like having an outlet, having a, you know, others who you can, you can just share that journey with in a way. And what came out of that for me was this opportunity to reflect on the sources of momentum I have or the, or the, the um, I, I, was, I came to start calling them um, the wells, <laughs> you know, drinking water mm -hmm. from the wells. So I, I have four of them and it's this two by two that I, I kind of made up as I was going last week, um, reflecting on external factors out there in the world versus internal factors. Yeah, things I care about. And then there's sort of validation as in you know positive and and there's invalidation or negative so an example of internal validation would be just a belief that i'm doing the right thing i care about this problem so much I and mean, yeah fuck the haters i'm just going to run at it <laughs> external validation is like you know the the feeling you get when you see someone tweet something really positive about you these guys are killing it you know what an exciting company what an exciting opportunity <laughs> Internal um, invalidation or fear is like the, what if I fail? Uh, like people have put me up on a podium. It's the desperation of, I don't want to go back to where I was. <laughs> it, if you think of external invalidation, it's the fear that you might be ridiculed or, or like there's a challenger who's going to take my opportunity. Like, uh, or somebody's come out and said, you know, they're doing it wrong and, and I've got to chip my shoulder and prove them wrong. And the, the moment of, yeah, reality I had was that this um, yeah, over drinking from either of those wells <laughs> is poison. <laughs> like you imagine I, if I'm only drinking from the internal validation, then I'm just running, steamrolling everything and everyone around me, creating a toxic work environment for my, you know, my team who are saying, don't do that. And, and I'm saying, fuck the haters, we're doing it. <laughs> if I'm only drawing from external validation that I'm over optimizing for hype i'm increasing the, the the delta between hype and reality creating a debt that i'm gonna have to pay down i'm getting too hung up on you know the the ego and the vanity of the of the if i'm only drawing from the internal fear or invalidation frankly that's a really fast road to mental instability and i've been down that path it's like what if i fail you know what if what are all the bad things that can possibly happen and and it reinforces itself until you're in Paralys. Uh, and, and like one of the things, you know, realizing that everybody has been certain, you know, j steps down that road or not. If I'm over optimizing towards external invalidation, then you're like, I will over respond to any potential threat. I see a challenger, I see a competitor, they're doing that, we're gonna do that. <laughs> it's like the, um, the, 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 the metaphor of you're riding your bike down the road and, and if, if all you're doing is watching yeah, you know, over your shoulder for the guy coming up behind you, then you're just going to write. You're going to miss the corner. You're going to ride into a into a cliff. Um, and so, to, for me, there was this moment of um, understanding my own sources of motivation um, and where I draw that energy from and why I'm here, and being able to consciously rebalance those. But the point I think to zoom out again is that I was only able to do that because of this being a part of a community of my peers at you know mm -hmm. all similar stages going all similar journeys but with different life experiences and inputs and upbringings and you know depending on your family when you're growing up and your friends and you know your everything about you everyone is different people are more naturally inclined to fit themselves into one of those four boxes but it was the journey through that cohort that helped me see the the forest for the trees so to speak um, so i want to create that kind of energy for people at you know, different life stages and in particular it's this moment of like any, anybody who has stood on the edge of the cliff and considered jumping you know, the cliff metaphorically being leaving their job um, or making a really hard decision that has asymmetric up or downside the insecurity and the, and the, and the vulnerability of that stage imagine if we could help x percent more people take that leap with the knowledge that even if it doesn't work out, they're going to be more likely to find a job through this network. They're going to be more likely to, you know, have a good time, make some friends <laughs> who, you know, be able to support them along the way. Like that's worst case. And best case is that you find someone to co-found the company with, or you, you, you get the feedback that allows you to pivot to build the thing that's going to be the breakout opportunity that's going to make, you know, change your financial you know, economic outcome for generations to come 
these are pretty impactful moments. And if we want to make a dent on the world, imagine just doing that for a handful of people every year. And it's motivating. Something I'm wondering, so if we're focusing on this IRO energy, San Francisco, a lot of the spirit of, of, of 2020, what were the sorts of on deck founder experiences that maybe like we tried our best to replicate in Slack and, and with virtual and with like city events. Like what are those stories from 2018, 2019, 2020 that you're just like looking forward back to when you're, yeah. like, you're looking forward to as you're thinking of just like the hallways happening again? <laughs> yeah. There was, um, Frankly, I, I have very fond memories of the, the experimentation we did in 2020, 2021 of trying to recreate the offline magic. We had, as you know, an example, pre-pandemic, there was always a kickoff retreat. And to get to the kickoff retreat, people would carpool together and we'd organize carpools and we'd match people based on who we thought they'd be you know, interested in meeting first. But we wouldn't tell them that. We'd just say, hey, random assortment, here's your carpools. And they'd hop in and they'd drive together for two or three hours. We gave them a few prompts. We said, you know, make sure you, you know, you, you like you dig in to break the ice to go into these directions. Um, and then when they got to the destination, we'd like randomly call on some people and say, hey, you know, Marshall, introduce someone from your car. Why, why are they interesting? <laughs> kind of puts them on the spot, breaks the, the, the ice. So we tried to re recreate that. There was carpools. And we literally call them carpools, uh, you know, for the virtual kickoffs. We had, um, you know, uh, stock footage of looking out the front window of, of a car driving through major cities around the world and five people were sitting on a Zoom, you know, recreating that experience. Um, the hallways are another one, you know, making sure that when you have, um, you know, a, a, a group coming together, let's say it's 30, 40, 50, 100 people having Zoom rooms that you can create, you know, break the 20 minute, um, you know, conversation to drop out into 10 minute breakout Zoom rooms and back in again. Um, so as I come back into this next phase, I mean, it's worth sort of directly talking about this. Um, we are returning to the kickoff retreat. So OF17, the one we're announcing, you know, today and recording this, uh, but by the time anybody listens to this, we, you know, a couple of days ago, um, ODF17 is kicking off with a, with a, a retreat in person in San Francisco. It's engineered in the same way to help you build relationships with you know, ideally sort of a light touch um, relationship with 100 people and also like a deep relationship with five to 10 people who can be your nodes into that greater network. Um, we're also hosting a lot of, uh, also, and so over the course of that, uh, the, the second weekend and after that retreat, um, there's four weeks of in-person and, and virtual programming. Like we heavily recommend people Try to get there if they can. If they can't, that's not a problem because you know everybody has their own life circumstances and, and requirements. Um, and so, you know, a lot of stuff will be live streamed, and there will still be a lot of like standalone virtual programming. But heavily recommend people come. But it's a thoughtful menu of events. It's like you know, co-founder dating, co-working, pitch feedback, curated. You know, inviting a lot of our uh, VC firm friends to come in and host a conversation and a dinner. Um, you know, inviting. Uh, Many of our early alumni who have gone on to build successful companies to talk, you know, reflect on their journeys. Um, a, a lot of opportunities, frankly, just to have the the offline real talk that has been missing. Um, so looking to you know, balance those in order to do so. Uh, this is a really exciting update. Me in particular, you know, we're opening up a, a, a community space. Um, we're, we're locking in a few different options and so we'll hopefully be able to share specific soon, but optimizing towards sort of big warehouse style, op, you know, remix the format, there's sort of a, a couple of small seating areas, a couple of long co-working tables, a couple of, like, how do you optimize towards creative collisions? How do you create the expectation that you come into this space with an open mind to meet people? You're not going to do deep work here. You're going to come in because you want to, you know, maximize the serendipity in your life. Um, so I'm really excited to share more about that. Um, we you know, think about the, the walking the line of, we're not going back to IRL only. We're trying to nail the mix in a way that people can come in, get the most out of their time in person, but also really easily transcend that or, or transition that back to being able to tap into a resource remotely, virtually, 
for the rest, you know, for the next five, 10 years as they build these companies, how do they tap into this community to hire? How do they tap into this community to you know, build momentum behind new product launches? Everything else that comes with it. So, um, you know, <laughs> as On The Eggerway says, we're gonna continue experimenting with and you know, uh, iterating on different experiments as we go, but really excited for the next couple of years of, of this, this chapter. Could you speak to how the virtual side of on deck will work then? So if like the, you know, the, the program's been virtual for almost the past three years, like what is that gonna look like, especially with cohorts moving forward, if you're gonna yeah. have this deeply in-person aspect yeah. at the start? I mean, we, we have to set expectations, obviously that it, it, it won't be everything that being in-person in the flesh is, because you know, part of creating that in-person magic is deliberately you know, not, uh, or like creating the intimacy of the room and not just live streaming everything that's you know, said in an offline space. That said, there's a couple of really unique aspects to it. Like the, the on deck Slack is so, you know, infamous, famous somewhat for just the, the energy that it brings. Um, there is, you know, now there'll be 17 cohorts of people in there. We're still seeing really high activity, even from early people who joined it two or three years ago. Um, I used to, I remember the moment speaking to Slack's enterprise team and we, we were doing something that they couldn't understand. They're like, every community that uses this product starts out here and then goes here. And on deck had somehow just maintained this really steady activity across thousands of people. But the downside of that is it can get quite noisy. Like Slack it, yeah, at, the, at the worst of times can create more stress, more anxiety than it, than it alleviates because there's so much, it was like FOMO, you know, so much going on. How do I find out what's relevant to me? So, so we're building and have now for the last four or five years been building a lot of product that sits on top of that. Started out life called the On Deck Directory. It's got a, a code name Project Crew at the moment. Love our nautical references, metaphors. Um, <laughs> and this is, it's, it's designed to be you know, what LinkedIn should be if it were built for a highly curated group of ambitious people. <laughs> It's the profile, it's the listing out what you're interested in building, what your experience, what your goals are. It's the ability to search and discover and be recommended people based on those criteria. It's deeply wired into Slack. So a lot of the time it's like signposting a conversation that can then connect back over to Slack. And you know, if you're, for example, um, posting an ask, you know, I'm looking for somebody who can help me get, give feedback on this new user experience design. You might post that on asks, but it's pulled back through your profile. And then as everybody comments, that's pulled back through your profile. You can see on somebody's profile, like I'll look up Marshall and I'll see, well, you know, he's made four asks of the community and he's replied to 20 asks threads. So I'm like, oh, Marshall is a contributor. You know, he's, he's putting out more than he's taking, which is one of the core values of the community. How do you, how do you identify the people who are um, not only ambitions, ambitious, driven, you know, in it to win it, but also come in with a spirit of service and know that the best way to get ahead is to give first, is just like put a signpost out that says, I'm an expert at this and I'd love to help you understand it better. And when you say that, knowing that interesting people are gonna come and serendipity ensues. So the the virtual experience, um, it's very, uh, very so it's, it's anchored around like, you know, live streaming, offline conversations, plus some entirely virtual forums, you know, we'll host, host guests who aren't in the city virtually. Um, and all of that goes out to the community. It's also recorded, archived, searchable, transcribed, and then all of the content of what's said searchable within the OnDeck directory. Uh, and in addition to that, there is the ongoing, you know, committed development. You know, we are at this point, a pretty well resourced company. We're sitting on three and a half years of runway and have a product and engineering team of 10 incredibly talented people who are building this and talking to founders all day, every day and understanding how we can better serve them throughout that journey. Trying to balance the intimacy of the room with the liquidity of the network. And that's, that's a very fine line to walk, but uh, we're here for it. You know, You've entirely sold me on IRL. You sold me on getting together for community and SF. Um, that said, I think a lot of listeners are going to be thinking, okay, all of that, let's take that as a given. Why on deck specifically? Obviously, you know, YC, um, 
is running in-person cohorts. You have South Park Commons. You have a variety of different programs that are going through this. And maybe it's not helpful to frame this as a zero-sum game because you know that's kind of what's, that's what's like so exciting about the space that we're in is that it isn't to a certain degree. But how how do you think how would how do you place on deck within the ecosystem that talented, ambitious folks? For example, let's say that person who's just spent ten to fifteen years at a big tech company is thinking about their options. How would you place on deck within that ecosystem? The um, the jumping off point I'm going to take is you know zero sum games. Um, we uh, nobody you know most people don't know this. The company that is behind on deck is called N Zero Labs for non zero sum. It's been the, the cutting principle of, of we believe that. Um, this is a very positive sum organization and to, to like to dem demonstrate that I have a huge amount of respect for, for YC, a huge amount of respect for you know, anybody that's like the amount of impact that they've created is, in the world is probably second to, to almost none, <laughs> um, almost none like that. Um, but you know what I mean? Because the, the companies that have come out of that have changed the world. Now, um, when I look at the landscape that they were established in, 2005, the bottleneck to starting a company was capital from Sand Hill Road and capital from Sand Hill Road flowed to people with MBAs from great schools. Paul Graham uh, identifies an opportunity to back software engineers, young, hungry people who knew how to use, you know, it was even pre-AWS, but as AWS and a lot of the open source you know, software became more readily available, and take a bet on people in a very structured way. Um, and over time that sort of shifted, it, like that feels really obvious in hindsight, but that was very unobvious, very, you know, con very controversial at the time. Um, at that point, it, it shifted the bottleneck for starting up to software engineering skills. Anybody can start a company so long as you can figure out how to use data, you know, how to, how to like actually create the product. And if you look at the sort of the VC narrative, the pr dominant pre VC narrative today, it'd be clear like there's a lot of merit to this still today is that you back engineers who can you know, build the thing themselves. But it is a little, there's a little bit of a sea change and, and like today there's a, a few like buzz, buzzwords that, that uh, similar, um, demonstrate this, but like the rise of no code tools first was one of the mm -hmm. big ones we spotted three or four years ago meant that people who were non-technical could hack together different components of Webflow and Airtable and you know, Bubble and everything else. And they could build a workable product that could get out in the market and test a proposition and serve a customer. And if it worked, you'd raise money and you could you know, build an engineering team around that. Lately, it seems to be moving even faster. If you've been following anything that Replit's been doing recently, if you like tap into the, the font of, of generative AI, you can instruct ChatGPT3 to write the code that you need to you know, build the initial product. I'm not saying, like, I, I certainly not saying that technical skill is not required. That is you know, the opposite. It's just saying that more people can get started. More people can take that initial step to validate an idea. Now, where does this lead us? If like more people can get started, um, you do have, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, a huge amount of noise that comes up and, and it you know, reduces the barriers to, if you have a good idea, then somebody else might you know, catch up with you a lot quicker. So I believe fundamentally that the most valuable thing that a founder can have is an unfair advantage in their ability to hire talent quickly assemble an A-team who can move fastest and build an army of early supporters, customers, users, advocates, investors, people who are willing to put some skin in the game and say, stake, you know, I'm gonna lay my chips on this company to be the breakout opportunity in this. And where does that come from? Where that comes from community. Now, what, what are the sources of community that a founder can possibly tap into? YC is a really obvious one. Why do people go there? Because they get to, um, sell into the rest of the cohort. They get to use the you know the brand and the momentum of the institution, and that's valuable to companies. But it's also quite expensive. It's expensive in terms of dilution. You know, particularly with the new terms, you're you're, you're committing to giving away somewhere through you know eight to ten percent of your company on average to one investor. You know, very early in your journey, uh, is that the optimal cap table for you? 
you know, what if that 10% could go to 50 people, each of whom has a little bit of skin in the game and an interest in helping you, you know, get where you want to be. And it also clashes a little bit with the idea of basically the, the people who have access to capital, who have a little bit of a network that does want to support them, doesn't necessarily make sense to follow that path. In the same way that, you know, cable news was a bundle, which was a little, like it was everything under one roof and it was expensive. And then along comes Netflix and says, we're going to unbundle that and we're going to serve you this, you know, one, one specific thing you want, cheaper. <laughs> On Deck wants to say, um, you know, the accelerator is a bundle and we think it's too expensive. And we think that the best founders don't want to give up huge amounts of equity very early on. So we say, join on deck. It's non-dilutive. It's, you know, there is no specific equity requirement that you must give to join. And you know that it's a community, very high caliber community of your peers who will be you know, able to provide you that support, that feedback, maybe join you, maybe refer a friend to join you help you get that breakout momentum to be one of the companies that can actually make it out of that, you know, make it out of the, um, out of the, off the starting blocks and even get in the race. And um, we do also invest. Uh, so there's a really important distinction here because um, when you join on deck, we have a community fund, which is backed by a lot of community members. We're very upfront about like, you are joining a community. You don't have to give up. You don't have to let us invest, but we really hope you want us to. And you know, when we do, um, we so one, there's a small fee associated with joining the program in the first place. It covers the cost of the retreat, covers the, the workspace, the basic. You're purchasing a premium product when you join on deck. But if we invest in you, we give that back. We refund you entirely. Um, we also have a you know a couple of different options. Like we would love to help you develop your pitch introduce you to angels who you know will be experienced in helping craft and target a specific audience or t target a specific type of investor um, we're also uh, we'd love to you know see companies that are success you know having some success in, in raising their rounds and just to come come along for the ride with the knowledge that uh, you can continue tapping into this resource throughout the, the journey as you go you know post C, post series A, you can come back and you can tap into our referral based hiring network uh, as a product that, that we're, we're announcing soon. And we're, um, yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of good stuff happening under that. So I, I do, I, I, I want to come back and draw that distinction with a big you know, line under, underneath it. Yeah, Accelerate is a huge amount of respect for the impact that they've had in the world. Empowered a lot of people, put a lot of people in business, create a lot of value, but not for everyone. And I think that there is an underserved audience of people who are, don't necessarily need to go to one, you know, any particular program, but they do really value what community brings and we want to work with them. So here is the last big question, which kind of brings together a couple of things you've hit here. So let's put aside someone who's like cynical or pessimistic about the, the market conditions, the type of person who I think may still be on the fence who I identify with on a couple of different levels is the person who thinks of themselves as being strategic. So it's like, David, you're right. You know, um, it's true that there are always opportunities, AI, aerospace, deep knowledge, all that stuff. But you know what? In 2023, I'm going to focus on keeping my big tech job or getting a new big tech job. I'll check in with you in 2025, 2026. Because we could say that it's 2004 and Facebook is about to be funded or it's 2006 and the mobile internet's about to come. What happens if it's actually the year 2000? What do you say to that person in terms of like why the wait and see strategic approach, because I'm, I'm guessing you're thinking that's not probably the best approach in all yeah. cases. Like what's your response to them? I, I think that I mean, what you say is really valid for an individual to, to think and feel based on their circumstances. Maybe they aren't in the, you know, what's the, what's the layer behind that? Maybe they just bought a house and they've got a big mortgage. Maybe they're just about to have a kid. There's a lot of things that go into any one person's decision. Um, and frankly, we don't mind that. Like if you told me, I'm not going to join this cohort, I'll, you know, let's catch up next year. Like we, in fact, the last check we wrote out of the Ondeat Community Fund was, was a guy who was an ODF one. And he's at Tesla and he has wow. had a phenomenal run at Tesla. And he's like, I, I joined this because I thought I might start a company, but 
I'm not quite ready yet because I've got a lot of responsibility and a lot of upside. So I'm just going to stick it out and, you know, in the process now of, of getting that journey underway two years later. And, you know, that community has been a resource throughout that journey, but now is the time to take the leap. Um, similarly, uh, I had a, you know, we, I hosted a dinner here in San Francisco a couple of nights ago. There was a, a fantastic, you know, um, person along at that who I'd love to back. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was, uh, so he's working in a robotics division of a, of a big tech company. And he said, well, I do want to build this thing, but there's an opportunity now, you know, project I want to build at work. And if it works, it's going to be great. And so I'm just going to like, at least see where that road goes. And I said, yes, <laughs> you should do that. Because if that, that, that is the way that you can have the most impact in the world. And by the way, if that ever changes, if it doesn't work or if it works and then you decide to move on again, you know where to come. So we're in a very long term game with very long term people. Um, we do have, I mean, there's 70, 65 something thousand people have applied to be a part of an ODF cohort historically. So we have a huge amount of information and we love seeing you know, conversations we've had in the past coming all the way back. That's one piece. So <laughs> make you feel better about that. On the other hand, I'd say, well, what is stopping you? Uh, like you clearly look like someone who really wants to make something happen in the world. Like, do you have, do you have a feeling that you need to collect more badges? You need to be better. You need to have done more before you start. Like, are you optimizing to staying here because you, you know, you don't think that you're good enough yet <laughs> because that's not true, right? Great founders can come from anywhere. I want to hear about what's, driving you under the surface and actually um, the opportunity cost of trying now is a lot lower than people think like you know i hear people you know imagine having this conversation with yourself oh what if i start something and it doesn't work and everyone will laugh at me and everyone will think i'm a failure and that's just not true <laughs> you know or if it is true then you're friends with the wrong people um but if uh if you take a leap, then you are, at the worst case, like I said earlier, the worst case, you're going to wind up with some phenomenal experience that you wouldn't have had sitting under the big safe, big, big tech roof. A bunch of new friends who you made along the way because they're taking a leap with you and there's no stronger bonding moment than when you are, you know, in the trenches with someone, so to speak. And the opportunity to do it again, step up and do it again. And, and that applies even more so, like the more experienced someone is, the easier it is for them to go back and get another job afterwards. And the kinds of jobs that you wanna go back and get afterwards are probably gonna value your experience as a founder. Where if you know, they wouldn't value your experience as a founder, I'd say, well, what do you want that job for? So I, I'm, you know, there's disclaimer across all of this that this framework applies very differently to different people um, but I believe that you know, it, it's really all about the sources of motivation. It's about the, the deep reflection on who am I and what do I want to build? And the right answer for a lot of people is I want to keep being able to afford my mortgage for a, a while longer and I don't have the burning desire to build. And that's great. I want to support that. And in fact, maybe we can get you plugged into the community another way. Maybe you want to advise. You know, maybe you want to angel invest. Maybe you want to, you know, join the job board in a very, you know, subtle way that you can search for founders that are taking off and join them, but without having to, you know, quit your job and hand notice. So there's there's a little bit of, of optionality around that that we we like to build in. Yeah, I think that's really well said, especially just the obvious in retrospect advice that you should just circle back to your north star of what's driving you, and that could be a couple of different answers. So David, this has been really excellent. Obviously, this is coming out after the ODF 17 announcement, so where should folks go to learn more? ODF 17 is kicking off April 21st, I believe. It's about 10 weeks away from time of recording, which is plenty of time to deeply contemplate you know, what you want to do with your, your, your career, and, and um, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, DM me on Twitter, it's actually open and I, I'm usually pretty good about getting into my uh, message requests. David at beyonddeck.com um, for an email if that's easier. Um, applications are open, beyonddeck.com forward slash founders or just on the, you know, the homepage, you're gonna find it super easily as well. There's an FAQ up there. 
Uh, I'd, I'd say like to my earlier point, even if this isn't quite for you yet, we'd still love to hear from you. And like worst case, we, you know, we check in once and we say, hey, come back in six months and it's a good outcome. So um, I want to uh, bring the energy for anyone out there who's like looking at the state of the world saying the sky is falling. You know, we're all in for a rough ride. I don't want to sugarcoat that, but um, there is a lot of energy. There's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of opportunity and I want everyone to be able to step up and, and take it. So thank you for taking the time, man. It's been fun. Yeah, thanks for uh, joining us on The Deep End. Perfect.